I'd like to introduce to you uh, Amish Virtual. Um, Amish is a uh, professional jazz musician uh, and John's in his own band, the uh, Amish Virtual Trio. Sorry? Amish Virtual Trio. The Amish Virtual Trio, um, and he's beginning tomorrow. Um, I, however, best know Amish as a, a very dedicated and um, absolutely undefatable um, campaigner uh, who's been campaigning uh, on issues around live music for at least the past 11 years. Um, and he's going to talk about a campaign around the 2003 Licensing Act. Um, this will take the form of a kind of a Q and A with Hamish, but we did think it would, might be useful uh, before we start to outline a little bit of the 2003 Licensing Act as it applied to England and Wales, and the main things that it did, uh, which affected live music in particular. Um, the 2003 Act amalgamated some separate, licen separate licensing regimes. And if you recall at the time, it was heralded in the press as being the kind of start of 24 hour drinking <coughs> in England and Wales. It was basically a, a form of alcohol licensing. Um, it moved responsibility away from uh, magistrates who had previously been responsible for licensing and to local authorities. And it also removed um, responsibility at the national level away from the Home Office to the DCMS. Um, when, it was first pub when the bill was published in 2002, the Culture Secretary Tessa Jowell um, described it as being a licensing re regime for the 21st century. Uh, the government also predicted at that time, I remember, a boom in live music would follow. Um, it was an attempt to kind of streamline, modernise, but um, one of the things it did would have a detrimental effect on live music uh, because of a need to ensure public safety, prevent crime and disorder and so on. Uh, new provisions were brought in under that act, which for the first time meant that um, any musical act uh, required a license. It removed the so-called two and a bar provision, which uh, under the previous 1964 licensing act allowed up to two musicians to play in a bar without the need for a license. So suddenly, a whole range of musical acts became licensable. Licensable? That's a word. <laughs> uh, subject to a license for the first time ever. Um, there were various sorts of anomalies around this, and private parties became subject to licenses and so on and so forth. Of course, um, big screen entertainment like football didn't need a, a separate license, so there were various anomalies. Um, as, um, one of the things that the government did, of course, was to set up a live music forum to um, study the impact of the act. That live music forum reported in 2007 and said that despite government claims that there was going to be, be a boom in live music, uh, the overall effect was, quote, broadly neutral. Um, other commentators have suge suggested that rather than being broadly neutral, um, it was actually detrimental to a lot of smaller venues and a lot of um, smaller live, live events. Um, so Hamish is much more of an expert in, 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 the, in these things. He's been campaigning very determinedly for a number of years around it. And I thought we might really start Hamish by saying where we are now, what the current, the current regime is, and how it's going to change in October when, when the bill is actually implemented. Yeah, well the current regime is that um, if you want to, uh, as a musician, say go to a local restaurant or bar and say, look, I'd like to put on a gig uh, maybe on Friday nights, uh, it'll just be me, maybe be on the piano or something, and um, I'll put up a poster outside, I'll do all the promotion for you. If that venue hasn't got a live music permission on its, uh, what is now called its premises license, that is a potential criminal offence for the, for the manager of the venue. And uh, although there is an exemption in the Licensing Act for what is called incidental music, which was um, partly as a, as a result of work I was doing for the Musicians' Union when the Act was a bill in 2002-2003, um, it's hardly been invoked. In fact, local authorities seem to go out of their way to avoid explaining to venues when they're applying for licenses that this exemption even exists. So, um, the penalty is quite severe. It, you could, if you were found guilty, um, face a fine of up to £20,000 and then six months in prison. It's quite, quite a deterrent. Although it's rarely actually prosecuted, Threats of prosecution are quite common, so the environment for small venues, grassroots venues, is one of, uh, of duress, really. And um, the extent uh, to which venues are licensed is a little bit difficult to determine. There have been studies by the DCMS which put the figure possibly at 50% of pubs, uh, certainly far fewer restaurants, possibly 25%. Uh, but what they didn't look at and has never really been looked at nationally 
are the conditions uh, that are attached to licenses even when they're granted. So typically um, they will run to a schedule of uh, sometimes up to 50 or even 100 conditions on the venue for having, you know, putting on live music, often duplicating uh, health and safety conditions that are required under separate legislation. But for live music, it's not uncommon still to have conditions restricting the number of performers to two or three, uh, and even the genres of music uh, to maybe classical or jazz, in the hope, in the clumsy ambition that this uh, is going to prevent noise complaints from neighbours. And this is really the primary concern of local authorities uh, when enforcing the legislation. Uh, it even, as, as you suggested, applies to private gigs. If you're um, putting on a private event, and by that I mean it's available only uh, perhaps to uh, people who buy a ticket of a, a, a very limited promotion, nobody else could get in on the night. If you're raising money for charity, that is caught. So schools uh, may be wanting to uh, put on a concert and charging five, ten pounds a ticket uh, to help fund perhaps another uh, music room, that could be caught. And in fact, students have had enforcement action taken against them. So that's the current position. Uh, but what was won, finally, in, uh, in Parliament, um, really the, the date of the, of the win was the 20th of January, uh, at third reading, was uh, an act called now the Live Music Act 2012, which will allow uh, any venue, pretty much, not to worry about entertainment licensing, provided the live music takes place between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, and if it's amplified, uh, there's a limit of 200 uh, up to the audience that is watching. If it's unamplified, there's no audience limit. The Act also removes, and this is another uh, very important element of it, uh, in the Licensing Act, <clears throat> there's also a requirement to, to license the provision of what they call entertainment facilities. And that extends to amplification, stage, um, uh, lighting, that sort of thing, if it's for pro providing live music or the facility for people to make music. That's how it's defined. So it's a slightly different definition. And uh, a parliamentary question a couple of years ago discovered that um, although maybe 50% of pubs had uh, a live music permission, only about 20% of all venues had a permission for entertainment facilities. So really, it was unlikely that uh, if you were being strict about it, about 80% of venues were probably unable technically to have live music. And the Live Music Act, um, that's what it looks like, I've, I've had mine autographed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and others. Um, actually, that was given to me. Very nice. Um, that removes the requirement to license entertainment facilities entirely. So that's going to go um, when this is implemented, which is hoped to be on the 1st of October. Um, it's been very controversial and it's been a very hard fought campaign uh, and in fact lobbying on changing entertainment licensing dates back to at least the early 1980s. And in fact when, when people um, ask, you know, well what's the impact of entertainment licensing, is it really, has it really uh, caused live music that much harm? It's a very difficult question to answer with actual, you know, data and evidence because really if it began anywhere severe at any time severely it was in 1982 when uh, the then conservative government <coughs> introduced uh, uh, legislation called the local government miscellaneous provisions act and what that did uh, was give um, local authorities the power to charge what they like for entertainment licensing fees and it also um, transferred entertainment licensing from magistrates to local authorities. And before that time, by all accounts, the way magistrates handled uh, the distribution of entertainment licenses was pretty light touch and it cost a 
ethical and sort of rate. But after the Local Government Miscellaneous Provisions Act, the fees for entertainment licenses rapidly rose by hundreds of percent, quite literally from, say, 300 a year in London for a pub to 3,000 a year. And it's in that period, the 80s and early 90s, that anecdotally you hear most of the complaints from musicians that these small gigs are going. So it's got a, a very long history, and the studies that were done by the DCMS to evaluate the pre- and post-impact of this, of the new licensing act, I would argue were methodologi methodologically flawed and, and unlikely to really show very much. Um, the real impact had been long before, and if the, if the culture of live music had, uh, <coughs> in small venues, had, had died out, the, the reasons for it weren't going to be ascertained by the questions they were asking in these studies. But as it happened, of course, as has already been alluded to, um, the DCMS Live Music Forum, which was set up in 2004 and headed by Fergal Sharkey, uh, did conclude in, in 2007 that although the broad impact was neutral, there was harm for small venues. And the DCMS didn't like that very much, and they really rather distanced themselves from Fergal Sharkey when he said it. This was a quote, you know, from Fergal Sharkey as head of the live music forum, that DCMS maintained a different position, which was that live music was thriving. And this was derived from uh, the so-called uh, surveys of live music, from the Mori survey of 2004, uh, followed up by the BMRB survey of 2007. But uh, I and others challenged the, the analysis of the statistics, the claims made on them, and this got very heated. And uh, the UK Statistics Authority got involved, and they requested DCMS to, to moderate some of their claims and to change the way they, they did the statistics. But now we're getting closer to um, the general election of 2010. And there was, towards the end of the Labour government's uh, administration, a change of heart by Labour, who had been very anti-reform. Um, there was a demonstration organised by Equity primarily uh, for 22nd of October 2009, outside Parliament. The Musicians' Union uh, also participated. and. Uh, that was due to uh, take place on the day uh, of a debate in Westminster Hall uh, where Jerry Sutcliffe, the then licensing minister, was going to talk about uh, some radical plans he had and they, they actually leaked it to the Guardian, so it was printed in the Guardian the day before that they were going to deregulate somewhat for live music or consult on deregulation. So a change of heart at the end of 2009 but in fact, um, the live music bill, as it then was, had, which had been working its way through slowly, um, uh, led by Lord Tim Clement Jones, and which I've been working on with him since he started uh, started it in 2009, um, was criticised somewhat for some uh, minor uh, limitations. It didn't apply at the time, I think, to restaurants, would only be pubs and bars would be limited to venues of a 200 capacity and not allow bigger places to have the exemption with small with two audiences of 200. Um, so we, we knew that this was going to fall. In the general election, all these unfinished business of government or private members, because they all end and you have to start again. But it was an opportunity, actually, to, to revise it and to incorporate uh, uh, criticisms uh, for its benefit to make it apply wider. And so uh, Tim did that, and um, by uh, March last year, 2011, it reached uh, second reading in the House of Lords, uh, and I was at that debate as, a, as an advisor. And that really is a historic debate, because there's wonderful contributions from Michael Grade, uh, Lord Grade, Joe Bakewell, who was a former head of the National Campaign Arts and uh, a Liberal Democrat, a uh, uh, former councillor from Wales called Jenny Randerson, 
where the, the impact of the licensing act on small geeks uh, uh, was really set out in quite a lot of detail and the, the benefit uh, the Live Music Act potentially could bring was, was praised. And it was after that debate when we sort of reconvened in the lobby that the new, the new team of civil servants came over to us and said, look, we just want to tell you we've decided, to, the minister's decided to back this, the minister being John Penrose, and um, whether it's through this mechanism or by some kind of legislative reform order, we are determined to bring in this reform. And so the tide really turned at that point after 10 years of campaigning on my part. Um, and I mustn't fail to mention, you know, the fact that there have been obviously many contributions and organisations who backed reform. And I just want to refer back to, to the early 90s, for example. A lot of musicians' union members had complained to the union in the 1980s and, uh, that you know, this was causing real problems for them, uh, the gigs that they, they, they had uh, relied on for a proportion of their income, particularly jazz and folk musicians. And a chap called Trevor Kay, who was a member, launched a campaign called the Campaign for Live Music in 1990. And I think he got quite some way in engaging politicians and getting questions raised in Parliament. But he was, um, he was rather ill and couldn't pursue it. And in fact, I think he died in 1993, but not before handing over to a gentleman called, um, I can't remember what his name is, Dick Laurie. Uh, who is a clarinetist and uh, publisher of this wonderful sort of underground jazz magazine, or the untraditional jazz magazine called Allegedly Hot News, <laughs> which he produces irregularly, but it is really quite a resource. And uh, Dick Laurie campaigned himself uh, with some success, getting questions asked, I believe, in Parliament, but not really getting momentum up for a campaign as such. Um, I kind of joined the fray in 1998 and I remember getting a meeting with the then General Secretary of the EMU, Dennis Scarn, at which, you know, he really just expressed disbelief that anybody could be whipped up into a kind of real campaign about this issue. So I, so I thought, well, it's true then, you know, the, the campaign is moribund, nothing is really being done on a national level. And so, um, you know, in terms of my involvement, starting back then, I found a very good uh, parliamentary sponsor, if you like, in Lord Reedsdale, who was then uh, a patron of the English Folk Dance and Song Society. And together with him and another peer called Tony Colwyn, who's a trumpeter, we organised a PR event in a pub in Whitehall, in the Red Lion, where they got chucked out of the pub for blowing um, and trumpets, as it were. <laughs> and uh, Billy Bragg attended and was very good and sang a few songs. And that that, that um, generated a lot of media interest, and it was at that point the EMU decided, well, maybe we'd better hire him. And so I was hired by the EMU as a parliamentary advisor to uh, try and get reform of some uh, exemption um, into the, the, the licensing bill. Uh, we did have some successes, but that actual, you know, the real key uh, goal was lost. Uh, the government of the day um, rejected the idea of, a, of an exemption for small gigs on the grounds that it would lead to uh, public disorder. They even read out a, a quote from the then head of ACPO, the Association of Chief Police Officers, which was, uh, live music uh, always leads to crime and disorder. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you know, we can't be one of this. And actually, on that very issue, uh, that, that exemption ping-ponged between the, the Commons and the Lords four times, which is something of a record, I think, only recently broken. So, I hope that uh, gives you an idea of the background to this really historic bit of legislation. Um, licensing, regulating live music goes back at least 250 years, and there were other kinds of acts before it, and uh, it has aroused a lot of uh, ire uh, among the authorities uh, over the years. But the rationale, really, for um, allowing an exemption of, of this nature now is 
most public safety, if not all, is regulated separately, so it's not contingent upon entertainment licensing conditions. And that also applies to fire safety. Uh, in 2005, laws were changed, uh, completely separating fire safety conditions from entertainment licensing, so it's no longer tied into it at all. Uh, only noise uh, is now argued, really, by any opponents of deregulation as justifying uh, licensing. Uh, but that argument has been won, that essentially what benefit is uh, gained by making it you know, a criminal offence to put on practically anything must be outweighed by allowing at least a certain amount of live music to take place spontaneously, immediately, uh, without uh, that sort of impediment of regulation. So, from October the 1st, the landscape will change radically, but what the impact will really be and how quickly any benefits will be felt, I mean, that is, that's a tricky one, that's a hard one to answer. It's been a very, very long time since it's been uh, as free as it will be between the two. Thank you very much, Hamish. That was a wonderfully succinct um, analysis of some fairly complex and, and, and a really long campaign. And, and um, there's, some, there's various interesting aspects to this, including those people who were supportive of, 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 of um, moves to, to get rid of the provisions of the 2003 Act. The, the MU itself, I think, kind of blew hot and cold, um, primarily because of its uh, links to the Labour Party. Uh, the local government authority um, was, also, was always opposed to. Um, getting rid of the, um, the 2003 Act. And interestingly enough, when reform does come, uh, it comes via the House of Lords, which um, um, Hamish and I were discussing this earlier, it's kind of an 11 year campaign which has benefited from the fact that you can ever talk to the same people in the House of Lords, an unelected chamber, mm. <laughs> rather than our democratically elected representatives who sat on their hands. Uh, so, so it has interesting implications for those of us who are interested in reforming the House of Lords. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's a fascinating tale, which I do hope that Hamish is, um, later is able to write up, because I think it is a fascinating tale. Um, we are coming up against time, uh, as usual, folks, but um, if there are a couple of questions, I know that Hamish will be happy to answer some. Simon, and then uh, go back to the office, because I'm afraid I don't know Simon, please. Um, There's two quick questions, which one of which can have a yes or no answer, and the other probably can't. One is, did you have any... Was there much support for the campaign from the live music industry as such, and promoters? And the second is, why was the Labour Party so opposed to the assembly because they having passed the bill that they wanted to change it? Okay, I'll answer the first question <coughs> is that in, in the past few years, the, the music industry, as represented by UK Music, which is their lobbying agency, yeah. has been totally behind it. Right. And Fergal Sharkey, when he was their CEO, was outspoken in support of reform. Um, and only two weeks ago, the UK Music, uh, with the Musicians Union, organised a thank you to politicians uh, and others. And I was, I was there um, specifically for bringing in the act. So, yes, to that one. Um, sorry, why was Labour so Why was Labour so opposed? That's a very tough one. It seemed to me, when I was working for the Musicians' Union, that they had been persuaded by the local authorities uh, that licensing was the best and only way to, to ensure that uh, venues putting on almost any live music would act responsibly and not cause mayhem in the local community. They seemed to buy very heavily into the idea of micro-regulation. At the same time as they were freeing up drinkers. Yeah. Might have been seen as the quick pro quo for being accused of freeing up people to drink. Maybe. Yeah. Um, just as, uh, sorry, my name's Rob. Um, I do promotions for, uh, for a local restaurant. Um, I think they're currently paying five grand for their license. And you say from the beginning of October, um, if they're, did you say was, if they've got two musicians, then there's no that they won't need the license. Sorry, could you just repeat what the, mm. how it's going to change? Mm. Not quite as you've got it. Uh, from the 1st of October, um, you won't need to have an entertainment license uh, authorization to have live music, and that applies irrespective of the number of performers. If you're a venue that's already got a 
and been through that process and you've already got a live music authorization on your premises license, there will probably be conditions. And the effect of the Live Music Act will be that those conditions will be unenforceable between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. So if you were a venue with the permission, and the permission came with the condition that you had only two performers, that would be cancelled out between 8 a.m. and 11 p.m. I'm not sure we get the figure of £5,000, though, because there aren't annual fees of that order, except for venues of the size of a, of a stadium. No, this is just a very, sorry, that was the, the figure that he quoted to me. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably or possibly be the, the total cost that, to acquire the permission in the first instance. It might be with lawyers' fees and everything. Um, and sorry, you just talk about with uh, music with and without amplification. Um, various instruments can play at different levels. Once you have a banjo in there, you, you can barely hear a guitar or a mandolin. Um, so you often need to use electric amplification to balance the sound, does the very fact you're having electric amplification there come under the come under the act, or will you be able to mic up a singer even if the other instrument can't? Amplification, as I understand it, of any level will invoke the 200 audience capacity limit. So you can you can have your music, no permission required, but you you mustn't have more than 200 people in the audience. How that's going to be monitored is another question. Mm -hmm. They'll probably, probably be asking venues to make sure they've got a system you know, to, to, of counting wristbands or something. Very quickly, then I know we must finish because we've got a okay. short break for the two. It's not, not a question, actually. It's, uh, you may have been about to say this, Martin, but I think it, it's just a fantastic campaign and a great victory, and a, a victory in the name of freedom, actually, it seems to me. So I wanted to express gratitude and admiration to Amish for the work he's done. Thank you very much. So the words out of my mouth, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>